there, I'm Glenn McDonald liu and this is the Family Health Lab. In today's conversation, I'm talking nutrition for mental health with Nicole Lawrence. Nicole is a licensed mental health counsellor and psychotherapist. She is sharing the profound changes that she's been seeing in her practice since using keto diet therapy alongside traditional methods of treatment for mental illness and neurological issues. Listen as Nicole shares the fundamental foods our brains need to function and to heal. You're listening to the Family Health Lab. Healthy parents, healthy kids. Welcome, Nicole. How lovely to chat to you. Thank you so much for having me, Claire. You're really active on social media, which is how I have come across your work. And um, I really enjoy your post, what you're putting out there and how well researched it all is. Um, you're a psychotherapist and a licensed mental health counsellor. Um, can you tell me who you work with mainly? It's, it's adult, adolescents and, I can't say it, adolescents and um, adults. Yes, uh, I do have some, I'm, I've been in private practice for 15 years. Um, and so I've worked primarily with adolescents and adults for that that time period and lots of varying diagnoses. Just I take insurance in the States and and you get all kinds of different levels of mental illness and stress and the whole gamut. And um, so what type of conditions um, over the 15 years do you specialize in a particular area? Uh, I think your your clients tend to be quite high functioning. Is that right? Well, it, it depends on the client for, for sure. So um, I'm not at a big medical center. I'm in a private practice. So I do, I do get people, uh, but, you know, usually I get bipolar disorder. I get lots of depression of, of varying levels, treatment resistant right down to uh, I'm stressed out about my life kind of thing. Um, different flavors of anxiety. I get OCD. I get generalized anxiety disorder, uh, panic disorder. So a whole kind of variety of, of diagnosis come through my office. And with the young people that you work with, what kind of age range are we talking? And um, has the presentations changed over the last, um, say, 15 years and beforehand when you were studying this this area quite intensely? Have you seen any changes in, in um, the type of symptoms or, or disorders? Yeah, so uh, self-harm is now exponentially more common than it used to be. That's for sure. It used to be kind of rare um, or less likely for sure when I first began my practice that many years ago. So that is when eating disorders are much more prevalent now. Um, and, you know, ang anxiety and depression. And, and I have to say that I think that adolescents are really struggling quite a lot. Um, and that the thing that I that I see, and this might be controversial, I don't know if you want me to say this, but the thing that I will say is that they are very quick to put a diagnosis on themselves for life stressors. Um, so things that 10, 12 years ago I would see in my office that I would, I, I would expect to see from an adolescent struggling to find themselves, having to deal with social issues, having to deal with their parents, that sort of thing. Um, they feel exponentially unable to deal with that. And they will often come in with a diagnosis already telling me how broken they are and how this is a lifelong condition and how this is not going to get better. And um, that is our very first work together is to point out that diagnoses are in fact temporary states they often do go away and that their diagnosis is not their personality that's um i think that's really interesting and um I, as working as a nutritionist um i've become much more interested over the last few years in mental health and um, what i'm seeing is echoing your experience uh in that um the children that i'm working with with maybe mood and behavioral issues and they they are diagnosing and they're talking casually about language around mental health or um saying they they they're undiagnosed but they they think they have asd or um uh, they're on the spectrum or they um 
think they're OCD. Um, it's a really casualized language around, around what a serious diagnosis. And uh, also asking to have mental health days quite a lot um, and saying that they need regular time off school. They can't, they can't um, attend practice because they need to take some time for themselves. I wonder whether that's where that's coming from. What, what do you think the, what's happening there? There, I mean, I had to go to school to diagnose people. I had to go to school to understand what was normal and what wasn't normal and the frequency and the chronicity of symptoms and whether it actually met criteria for a diagnosis and, and, you know, frequency and intensity. And so what, what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of uh, diagnosing going on where this has happened once or twice. This means this, or this happened during this time. And because that happened, this means this. And so I think that it's, it's a, it's a problem. Um, and I worry because, uh, this is a time when these kids are developing their sense of self and their ego and who they are and taking on a diagnosis that when they Google says that it is lifelong, um, affects and influences what they want for themselves, what they imagine for themselves, what they think they're capable of. And I just think that's pretty darn dangerous. Now, I know there is a big movement about neurodiversity, and I, I think that that's fantastic. Um, I think that I think it is normal in adolescence to be focusing in on and thinking about ways you are special. Nobody wants to be normal and boring, right, when they are in adolescence developing their ego, they are, they are looking for ways to be different and to understand and celebrate the ways that, that they are different. Um, but I think that, um, I think that if it gets to the place where they put limitations on how they're willing to interact in the world and demanding that the world completely change all of the ways that it possibly interacts with them, I'm not sure that that is going to help them in the long run in terms of getting what they want in life, whatever that might be. Mm. And I want your earlier comment about them seeing it as part of their uh, personality and you trying to disconnect that and let them see the difference and the evolvement of, of ourselves. I think it's really important. Otherwise they could be put in a box for life and really, um, blocked off from other potential. Um, you're, um, you're a, as I said, mental health counselor and a psychotherapist and you work across um, quite traditional and different modalities and um, therapies. Um, and you've become over the last years much more interested in nutritional therapies for, for mental health. And, um, from what I'm hearing, you're seeing very, very profound changes, um, with your patients that you're, you're practicing these dietary changes. And well, that sounds really exciting to me. I've got a big interest in nutrition, uh, and keto nutrition, I think is, is, it's absolutely a fascinating topic full of potential. So why has this got you fired up? Because I get to watch people get better and leave my practice at a much higher rate with much higher levels of improvement than I ever did doing evidence-based psychotherapies like cognitive behavioral therapy, DBT, and even EMDR, quite frankly. Um, and I and everybody, I think, that goes into any medical field wants to see people get better. That's why we do what we do. And so I think that any clinician that works with ketogenic diets and gets to see that, just you can't go back. You can't go back and ignore that piece. Um, so I'm curious about what kind of changes you're seeing in in clients with a range of different um, um, symptoms or behaviors or how, how they're presenting. How does that change for, for some of them or how has that changed? Well, you know, it... The ketogenic diets are are a metabolic psycho uh, psychiatry intervention for the brain. And so it kind of doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. When you improve brain health, you kind of see the same types of improvements. So um, so I'm always when you, you know, so for example, if you want to ask me about what I see with OCD, I'm going to have the same story as I see with a different anxiety disorder or bipolar or depression or binge eating disorder. The stories are really the same because the ketogenic diet just 
basically improves metabolic health in the brain and it improves nutrient density and nutrient availability for the brain. And so the brain does some really cool things. So what do I see with uh, OCD? I see less, rumina less rumination, ruminations go away. I see more chill. I see less worry. I see less being overwhelmed. Um, and I see, you know, improved frontal lobe function because there's better brain energy. You need a fully functioning frontal lobe with lots of brain energy to regulate emotion, you know? And so, so that's what I see. And, and it's not that different with my bipolar people. Uh, for them, it's, I'm, I'm not, they say things like, I, I'm not terrified that I'm going to fall into one of those depressions again. Like the medications for bipolar disorder for depression are not great and they are woefully insufficient. And so while someone with bipolar disorder may have their manic symptoms fairly well controlled with lithium or some other medications, we are abysmal at controlling the depressive symptoms. And so these poor people are suffering in this constant prodromal depression state all the time waiting to fall into the awful pit that is by a bipolar depressive episode. And so, you know, I hear them say they're not so afraid of that anymore, that they feel level, that they have energy, that they're not overwhelmed. Again, the stories are all the same regardless of diagnosis. Binge eating disorder. So my people with binge eating disorder that use a ketogenic diet for that purpose uh, they talk about improved energy. They talk about not feeling hungry all the time. They talk about not feeling overwhelmed and that improved emotion regulation that happens with the neurotransmitter balancing that occurs on a ketogenic diet that we have evidence for on a ketogenic diet. You know, if you, that helps disconnect some of that emotional eating behavior and it reduces carbohydrate, uh, you know, want, <laughs> desire. Um, and, and so they feel free. They feel in control of their life and they don't feel out of control and overwhelmed. Again, I hear it, it regardless of diagnosis. That must be so rewarding to you as a, as a long-term practitioner um, to come across a treatment that you can support people with and see those, those changes and with without side effects um although um there are some caveats around the keto diet with them um, uh side effects but they can be mitigated by management of the diet and by oh going a modified atkins route with with nutritional density yeah <laughs> let's <Go> talk <laughs> about side effects <laughs> yeah. right let's mm, talk let's so people yeah. talk about oh the ketogenic diet you're gonna get constipated you're gonna i, I mean they're they're all kinds of concerns, you know, about the people I work with are suffering. They don't care if they can't poop for a couple of weeks while their gut microbiome is figuring itself out. That is such a minute, like you have no idea. I mean, you probably do, but maybe your listeners who might be worried about the side effects of a ketogenic diet just don't understand what side effects are when it comes to psychiatric medications. I promise you a little diarrhea or a little problems going to the bathroom or having a little bit of keto flu for a week while you're figuring out your electrolytes, that is nothing compared to the suffering that people with mental illnesses and neurological disorders are dealing with. And their medication side effects are so severe. They have medications for the medication side effects. So, so, so when people say that, I'm just like, what in the world do you think these people are going through that they aren't I mean, they're willing to do whatever they need to do to have a fully functioning life. Um, so when people say that, I just think they just completely clueless about what side effects mean for this, this population. It, it's a totally different ball game. I think that's a really good point to, to hammer home that the, the side effects people are experiencing, the, the symptoms they're experiencing that perhaps aren't being fully managed with medication for one and the, the fear around that, um, that, that some people have and then the side effects of the medication. And we're not talking discomfort. We're, we're talking, um, dying decades younger. Uh, if you're on a medication long term, the, the metabolic side effects of the medications it takes are years off your life. Decade, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so going back to keto side effects, which are 
um, talked about over, o- overly overblown compared to side effects of medication. Um, when I say you can mitigate, you can, you can avoid really with, with a longer period of, um, of transitioning over to a change of food. Um, you can avoid that, you know, mild constipation or the gut type of symptoms and the keto flu type of symptoms. That short term discomfort you can actually avoid. And then, um, the long term, adherence to a ketogenic diet was linked with side effects um in um p in pediatrician um research with epilepsy um but they were different very very different keto diets they were yes. um selenium for, deficient diets yeah, yes and they were extraordinarily high fat and the, often the fats were and the foods given were um not nutrient dense they were not real foods necessarily they were often formula based so 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 really yes i think <laughs> i think we've kind of um i think they have good points to really really important points but how exciting um to work in a, a practice work in a field and come across uh, nutritional therapy. I mean, nutritional therapy isn't new to mental health and neurological conditions, um, but there's a lot of noise around nutrition and what should we be doing for our brain? What should we be doing for our body? And I think people are very, very confused. Do we, would you say, Nicole, do we have a definitive brain mood diet? Um, and if we do, what would, how would you? describe it. Yeah. So I think of it more as subcategories of a field. So, you know, I'm trained in the psychology field. So I think of like psychiatry and, and the way, you know, there, there's kind of two subfields in psychiatry that are kind of opening up. And one is nutritional psychiatry, which is increase your micronutrients, uh, maybe take gluten out, you know, maybe take dairy out, do some things that improve your nutrient intake so that your brain can work better. And um, nutritional psychiatry may or may not give any thought at all about brain metabolism. They're not thinking about, can this brain uptake glucose for fuel? They may or may not be thinking about, um, you know, do I need to, do I need to rescue this brain with this particular very specific metabolic therapy for the brain? So, so the, there's metabolic psychiatry and there's nutritional psychiatry. And yes, they are closely linked. I practice metabolic psychiatry, not a prescriber, but I do practice metabolic psychiatry. And do I think about nutrition? I have a functional nutrition background that I've added in. I absolutely think about micronutrient availability. I absolutely think about the quality of foods, the fact that they need adequate amino acids to make their neurotransmitters, all that good stuff. But it, it, it's not my focus. My focus is on that metabolic therapy for the brain to rescue rescue with symptoms and, and that sort of thing. Now, not everybody needs a hardcore ketogenic diet for to rescue symptoms of mood disorders. I personally think everybody should get to feel their brain on a ketogenic diet so that they can make the decision about how they want to eat. Because whatever you're imagining, you you don't know until you've experienced it, period. You don't know what increased brain energy looks like. You don't, you just don't know. So I think everybody should give it a go, personally. You don't need to, but it's good to know. It's good to experience. It's fun to experience, right? And Now, some people are not interested in that. And yes, increasing nutrient availability can be life changing, right? So I'm sure as a nutritionist, you've experienced the teenager coming in who's barely eating any protein, completely devoid of micronutrients. You put them on a whey shake. They finally have amino acids to make their neurotransmitters. They finally have some, you know, basic micronutrients they need to make their neurotransmitters to clean up oxidative stress and they flourish and they go off and they don't need a ketogenic diet. So both fields are quite necessary and both fields are quite, um, valuable and underutilized for sure. But, but, I want to make sure your listeners understand that there's a difference between nutritional psychiatry and metabolic psychiatry, that they're different types of interventions for different things going on. Mm. And I think that's a massively important um, point. Um, the, the difference, just for clarity, would be um, so you, uh, working with different families I work with um, within schools and uh, if I'm helping them with nutritional therapy and improving their diets, I'm 
cutting sugars down. I'm trying to cut processed foods, ultra processed foods that are linked to a number of different metabolic and uh, um, mental health harms. So we're going to see benefits from that. Additional benefits are going to be an uptake of real food, more nutrients, more micronutrients, um, hopefully more omegas, more V vitamins, more vitamins. All of that is, and I, I've seen and I do see amazing results. Um, and that's mood stabilization is possible um, from that approach because we have um, a number of different mechanisms in the body. One of the crucial ones being the endocrine system where you're stabilizing your blood sugar levels, your blood glucose and your insulin levels, which which really um, feeds into your, your mood and your energy levels. And that's, I mean, I, I see um, amazing differences. And with, with children with, with minor diagnoses or um, symptoms and behavioral symptoms as well. So what and that's, um, that's nutritional therapy on the, on a different side of things is a ketogenic diet, um, where we are changing the way the body and the brain particularly is fueled. We're, we're going from a glucose, um, burning, uh, brain and body. We're, we're changing over to burning ketones and it really changes the pathways of the brain and has amazing potential. Uh, and that's that's the that's the approach that you're focused on and you're you're working in primarily. Yeah, primarily. My my favorite thing to do is to meet with a patient or a client and and put them you know do an assessment and then educate them about ketogenic diet and talk about hey hey we could do this first on the way to therapy. And they do it because people really do want to know all the ways they can feel better. I mean, some of my patients, I'm their fifth therapist. They've been on lots of medications. They've tried, you know, transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy, you know, and, and, and they've tried different things. They've tried, uh, some have tried psychosyllabin, you know, they're desperate to feel better. So when I'm like, Hey, you need to know about this. They're like, Hey, you know, count me in. I'm going to do it. And what's really nice is I find that once they're transitioned to the ketogenic diet, when they actually focus in on doing psychotherapy, I find it so much easier for them to do the work. It's so much easier for them to do the work. So I do evidence-based therapies and there are worksheets and you have to be able to identify thoughts and you have to be able to notice your emotions and you have to be able to uh, control behavior. Like there's some point we're gonna have you do a behavioral intervention where you stop the behavior that you normally do and do something else. And all that requires a fairly functioning brain. And not that people not on a ketogenic diet can't make huge gains in therapy and improve and feel better. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying for the people who are truly impaired that have been trying different therapies for a long time and only getting minimal benefit, why wouldn't we improve the functioning of their brain first before we're like, okay, now we're going to teach you all the things that you need to, re you know, better emotion regulation skills, better communication skills, all that good stuff, because it's so much easier for them. I love that you're doing those modalities in combination and you're, and then you're seeing, seeing those improved results. And what I've, what you mentioned there and what I've heard you say in the past is you're really passionate by making sure that people are aware of their options. And yes. there don't seem to be many practitioners in your field that are using this approach. And, um, that, that's something that you feel quite strongly about, isn't it? That there's, there's a lot of people struggling. As you said, you might be their fifth, um, therapist. They may have tried multiple medications, um, lots and lots of natural approaches or other uh, exercise, all of these different approaches. But this is a, this is a significant, a profound, um, potential option for them. And they're, uh, people are not being made aware. Right. Right. And, and, and luckily there's more, like me coming. So um, I attended a low carb conference virtually and I was connected to uh, some social workers and a metabolic psychologist. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we're, we're out there and we exist. I think I, I get a little bit frustrated because in the, it's, it's happening, you know, it's happening. Stay positive. It's absolutely happening. But but in the psychology world, for example, so if, if you have a mental illness and you go, even if it isn't for an eating disorder, but you go to a licensed mental health counselor here in the States anyways, I don't know if it, what it's like where you are, but 
and you suggest a restrictive diet, you're like, hey, I heard this ketogenic diet's going to help my mental health. They will discourage you strongly from doing it. They will literally do harm by not educating themselves about this. This is a psychiatric treatment. And I think that is horrifying to tell someone that you're going to get an eating disorder if you do a ketogenic diet. That is just not how it works. Um, and there's some studies coming out. There's case studies published. There's RCT data going to be coming out pretty soon around that. So that is not what we see. And so for a, a mental health counselor or a psychologist to discourage someone with any type of mental illness from doing this diet, I think is just accidentally criminal. Yeah. Mm, we we do see that uh, across different um, health disciplines. Um, so working in wellbeing programs in England in the past, we saw people with diagnosis of cancer and other um, conditions being discouraged from exercise by their physicians. And um, in epilepsy, the keto diet was was and is often still discouraged. I, I feel a lot of that, and I've looked into research on on why that is. Um, and it seems a big, big, big part of it is the education. If you're um, um, a professional, if you're a practitioner, and you're not confident uh, in in that approach, and you um, maybe don't want to look stupid in front of your patients, or or just ha- lacking in uh, education and confidence in that. Um, therapy, then, then you're likely to, um, av- avoid it because it's the simplest, safest approach. Um, so, so yeah, I think we've, we've got a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm really reassured that the conferences and, uh, the research you just mentioned, a randomized control trial that's, that's coming out. And there's, there's, um, there's so much more noise and you're part of, of that noise. Um, so, so really appreciate you making these waves and making this noise because people are finding out about their options through, through your, um, your, your work. It's not just social media posts. You're actually well researched articles and presenting on studies. How, how did you come to, um, keto diets yourself. I know you have your own experience, um, with, with adopting a keto diet. Yeah. So I had, um, a chronic pain syndrome and I ended up on pain medication and I ended up stuck on pain medication because the doctors could not physiologically get me off of the pain medication. And then I was stuck on the bridge medication. And then finally we did an experimental Mm -hmm. protocol. And when I got done with that experimental protocol, my cognitive Mm -hmm. function just was awful. And I basically Mm -hmm. was so impaired that I met criteria for stage one Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. My brain was just, just mush. I don't know a better way to say it. Mm -hmm. Um, And it got a little bit better, but not a lot. And I uh, found a ketogenic diet through, I believe it was Dom D'Agostino talking about his cool diver, um, diver studies and talking about exogenous ketones and what was known about Alzheimer's back then. Um, and I also listened to a podcast with Will Cole was a doctor on a podcast that I was listening to talking about that. And I figured out how to get on one and make it work. And, um, And yeah, my brain lit up in four days after getting the macros right. And I was like, what is this? This, this is the best, you know, my husband's like, you're finding words again. I'm like, I know, I know I can, I can, I'm not making up words for the words I can't remember. And I'm able to access big words from my vocabulary that I thought was gone a long time ago. And um, it was wonderful. Three months later, I'm at the gym because once your brain energy goes up, you have body energy, right? Self-directed behavior. And uh, it continued to get better and better and better. And as and I noticed the effects on mood. I wouldn't have thought I, said I was anxious, but my I got chill. I was like, life is so not overwhelming. And the whole future just opens up when you're not overwhelmed by the smallest things anymore, right? And I was like, oh, my patients need this. My clients need this. Um, But I can't talk about it because I'm a licensed mental health counselor and they're going to take my license away. And so after a while, that became completely ethically, uh, you know, untainable. I couldn't I couldn't do that. It felt so unethical to sit there with these people suffering and not share with them that this was a treatment. And of course, you know, I'm 
reading the research on the cognitive effects. I'm starting to read the research on bipolar disorder and mood effects and depression. And, um, and I, I can't be quiet about this anymore. So I went and I got a lot of different extra education to kind of cover my license and be able to say, no, I'm practicing within my license. I absolutely am qualified to give nutritional advice as it applies to mental health. And, um, and then I, you know, I, I just did it that way, but it, it was my own experience, my own frustration with the medical establishment, my own, this isn't working and I don't know how to get better. And, and what can I do? What is there left? And, so I really have a lot of empathy for my patients who have had these disorders for really long times. And sometimes they're in a place where they're raring to go to look for treatments and I'm going to fix this and this is going to get better and I'm going to do all the work. But sometimes they're in places where they're like, it's fine. This is my life. This is the best I can do. It's good enough. It's okay to not dream big. I can find, you know, and I, and I totally get where they're at in these different places. Um, and I think my experience kind of helps me be a better therapist because I went through that. Mm, what a frightening experience at a young age to, I mean, at any age, but to, to be faced by some, some such as, I mean, a profound disability really. And, uh, and then, you know, loss of that cognitive function in that way at that age, it must have been absolutely terrifying. Um, so, so aren't we lucky? I do feel very lucky with my personal family experience of finding the keto diet at the time we did for our, our children's health. Um, that we're in a time we can do our own independent research. And, and then luckily the people you found it from, you're also going to be one of those people that um, somebody's going to hear about this option and do their own research or contact you directly with your private clinic. And um, it's going to change lives, which is pretty, um, I just think it's wonderful really to be sharing um, that, that sense of hope and opportunity for people that have been feeling quite hopeless up until now. Yeah, they really um, believe they only have the one option, yeah, therapy medication. And, and, medication mm, and, and medication, preferably medication and then maybe therapy. Like, you know, they really, they don't, they don't understand there's other options or they think it's woo-woo or that the, there's only one road to getting better, but really there's, there's others. Mm. And so this has been quite a pathway that you've been on. Um, getting the confidence and getting cred credentialed around and there's wider nutritional topics and, and you've been studying Dr. George Eid and, and others and joining forces, uh, making a lot of noise about this. And last year you won an award, a um, Metabolic Minder Award, which is absolutely amazing. Well done. And what does that mean to you in terms of your work? Is, is that going to have a, an impact? You know, I, I don't know. So, it was, it was, I was already doing all the things going on all the podcasts. I wrote a blog and I put a lot of research into the blog and I did that and I was already doing a lot of things. And, um, and then this, uh, this award, you know, applying for this award came out and I read it and I was like, this sounds like exactly what I do. Like I literally do. This was made for me. Right. So like, I'm going to apply. So I applied and then I got this award and this recognition for doing something that I'm already super passionate about doing and would have never stopped doing anyways. Um, but I was kind of tickled that it was uh, awarded in part by the Milken Institute, which I've always thought of as so in my head, because I'm always like thinking about how to get this out to people like, yes, that is a legit organization. And it brings a level of, you know, authority to this therapy. Like, why would the Milken Institute be giving out an award for a, you know, a therapy that doesn't work or doesn't have any research. But so I was excited about that part. And then getting to, you know, getting anything from the Bazooki Brain Research uh, Foundation is, is amazing because they are, they are spearheading all, not all, I shouldn't say that, m a lot, a majority, at least here, of this research that we need in order to, uh, make the data unassailable, quite frankly, so that it can be, you know, can be brought into mainstream and be offered as a treatment um, legitimately and hopefully covered by insurance even. Wouldn't that be great, right? You you get, you go to a psychiatric hospital, they put you on a ketogenic diet with a dietitian ready to help you out with that. You have support when you go home, your family understands why you need this diet. Like, what? 
what, how many, how much money would that end up saving everybody? Right. So that's my dream is something, something like that. But, but I think this is all a step in that direction. And so it makes me really excited. You know, someone else is going to be like, I'm going to talk about the ketogenic diet. So I can apply for this award. <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe it'll increase the amount of people talking about. Absolutely. I think, I, I think it already has. And we need more and more and more. I mean, looking at what happened with the epilepsy ketogenic diet field. I mean, we're a good, I know it's a hundred years old, but we're a good 20 to 30 years, um, of, of, of real, of professionals really trying to push this and champion this and, and different symposiums and conferences and, um, resources, but it, and it's still underutilized. But I think this is going to help mushroom this this out and we we like you say really credentialed um organizations involved in this and researchers and scientists and doctors i think i think the future is looking hopeful which is which is really good news and yeah so well well done on that it's great to have that recognition for for the impact that you're making yeah one of your recent articles was around autism, an area that I'm interested in. I work with families whose children are, um, have various degrees of um, uh, ASD and I've also worked in special needs schools with pupils changing their diets and had uh, amazing results, some totally different results. Some children, um, some students are able to adhere to diet changes, not catch on it, but low carb Um and had amazing, amazing mood changes, pers- personality kind of coming through, energy levels, more social, which is the key. Um, and others, they're so food restrictive, um, that they were, their breakthrough during working with them was them able, being able to just try a little bit of the food, which was for their parents, their family, for themselves, a big breakthrough, totally different. But um, what um, you you presented some research about where we are with um, keto diets. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that research in terms of autism. Yeah, I did just a a, a very mini lit review. Just I wanted to put that out on the internet so that parents can find it and know that there are some decent studies showing some good improvements in exactly the things that you're talking about. So. Uh, I don't work with autism spectrum or children. You probably, you see in real life what that research was saying. But, you know, they see improvements in behavior. They see improvements in social, uh, social signs. They, they see a lot of improvements. Um, and also things like, I can't remember if this is part of the research literature, but I also see, I've heard about improvements in digestion and a lot of other, you know, con- pieces that are really, really helpful. So I just, I, I think that the results of that literature review, I think that there's plenty of evidence to offer this to parents and to provide them support, you know, in implementing this, because I don't, we don't have a lot of psychopharmacology does not offer the autism community much in terms of help. So why wouldn't, why wouldn't we make this available to people? Why wouldn't we encourage them to seek this out as a possibility? And, and, and I think in that, um, just the roundup that you put together, um, you could pose the question, is, uh, is there any pharmaceutical intervention that, that delivers the results or these nutritional, um, interventions have? And absolutely, it's, um, they're just off the scale in terms of what's already offered to that community. But yeah, I just thought I'd touch on that because I found that roundup of, um, the review and the studies and, and we don't have enough studies. Um, but I, 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 I find that a very, very interesting topic. So, um, so, so I, I feel that you're working a lot to help prevent a lot of suffering in terms and to help people to kind of make fundamental changes in, in their lives with nutrition. In terms of, um, uh, nutrition generally, there's, we've got deficiencies involved. We've got changing the, um, the way the uh, brain is fueled. W- would you like families to know something about nutrition, um, in, in what the brain needs for to to maintain health and perhaps avoid some mental ill health or mood disorders or is there anything you'd like families to be aware of and what, what they could eat um and or ha- what they could change 
Yeah, I mean, you don't, once your kiddo is an adolescent and a teenager, you have less and less control over what they put in their mouth. And that's just the reality. And, and they are their own little people, their own persons, and they get to decide what they eat for sure. But I, I do feel like there's some things that you can do as a parent to try to minimize the likelihood of, of a crisis occurring because, um, because the adolescent time is a time of highly increased micronutrient need. And if your teenager is still eating a diet of their two year old diet of chicken nuggets and grilled cheese and, you know, they're probably not getting enough protein. They're probably increasing their processed foods. And as a parent, you need to understand that when you buy that processed food and it says it has protein in it, that those are plant based proteins and that your child is probably only absorbing half of that. And so your teenager you know, unless they're eating a nice big steak with you every night, they're probably not getting enough protein. And so understanding that. So I have a lot of parents add a whey shake in the morning, get that, get that bioavailable protein in. Um, I don't recommend plant proteins. It's a, I, I just don't think they're as bioavailable. Uh, I, and it's not just my opinion. Like there's papers that talk about the bioavailability issue. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is make sure you get them on a high quality, broad spectrum micronutrient supplement. Um, I believe True Hope is one that you guys have over there. It's, it's not, it has folic acid in it, which it's not my favorite form of, of folic acid, but it's better than nothing. My goodness, just put them on a good broad spectrum micronutrient during those years. I also really like Hardy's Nutritionals. They are a broad spectrum micronutrient out of Canada. And I think you just need to have them on a good multivitamin during that time. Like, don't mess around. Okay, that's um, that's good. So it's protein, micronutrients, and like you say, we've definitely, and I see this again and again in families, you definitely have less input into um, the, from the 12 years plus kind of age range. And um, what, what I'm seeing schools, um, giving to students as well is, is highly disappointing. Um, so poli policy change, I would love to see much more change in, in food policy so that to make it get the right messaging and we could, um, chip down on that access to um, harmful foods that may harm their mood, may harm their uh, brain energy, mitochondria, uh, lead to brain fog, which then kind of leads to that negative spiral. But I love the fact that we could potentially head off some damage. I mean, you're saying we could potentially head off um, crisis and we're in an age where uh, to eat meat is being a little, is not little, it's being demonized, but we're, like you say, we're at a fundamental growth stage uh, and particularly for the brain. Um, so in, um, to, to close and to, um, to, I don't want to take up too much of your time. What would you, what resource would you like families to, um, get in front of them, a book or a particular podcast to follow in terms of, um, managing their mental health, avoiding, uh, improving their nutrition or, or, or learning more about keto? Is, is there something that you particularly love and would like to share perhaps with a family? Um, or a, a young person who's experiencing some genuine mental ill health um, issues and, and wants to learn something. Right. So the the blogs that I write, uh, mentalhealthketo.com slash blog, I try to make those accessible. So I try to explain the science, the science uh, underlying the effects of the ketogenic diet in a way that's easy to understand. Um, that's one style, but there's, you know, other really great styles like Georgia Ede has a fantastic one that I think parents would really like called Diagnosis Diet. Um, and she, she has lots of really valuable nutrition articles there. Like, for example, if you have a teenager who is talking about going vegan and you're worried about the effects of that on brain health and mood, I would definitely send them over to diagnosisdiet.com. Um, that is another excellent one. There's lots of information on, I believe it's metabolic multiplier. Maybe I should look that up before I give it wrong. Um, but, but there's, there's some great, just do a Google search. Um, and, and again, I also find really good resources. So there is a functional psychiatry site called psychiatryredefined.org. 
that actually has, they do CMEs and continuing medical education training, but they also have a great, great webinars that they'll just do that are highly valuable to parents and even even teenagers that talk about like certain micronutrients, how you need them for certain things in the brain. It, it, it really helps bring that home that what you eat and what you do and different factors outside of even nutrition um, matter. And you have to pull on those levers in order to feel better. I like that, that it is, it's, um, we used to call it when we were trying to heal and help our children with their um, health conditions. We, as a family, me and my husband called it the 1%. So we would seek out something uh, and like optimizing nutrition and sleep and, and we would work on those and we would see 1% increment, 1% increment. And then keto was a huge leap. It was just a total game changer. But I like that you're giving them the tools and the research and the information to pull levers to, or levers to help them, uh, to, to head in a positive direction and start to manage and learn, learn more about this particular approach that could be their game changer for their mood, their energy, uh, and peace of mind and a calm mind to do more work if necessary. But I, I really appreciate you. It's a treat to, to, um, get a chance the first time we've actually had a, had a chat. So I, I really have enjoyed this and I would definitely, um, I'll put a link to your, your blog, uh, and I would definitely recommend reading that. It is very, very, uh, accessible and very informative. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please make sure to subscribe. This really helps us to be able to create more content. 